Hello and welcome to Raising Those Spirits podcast. I'm Steve. I'm Sam. I'm back to life after being a ghost last week. Yeah, it's because of all these ghost festivals we're researching. We just kind of found Ooh. a way to bring them back. Thank goodness, because good timing. I've got bills. I've got bills to pay. I don't. I. I don't have time to be dead. Yeah, I mean, I those don't go alive. away when you die. Weirdly. They do not. Okay, so this week we're. I mean, do we start with the festivals? What do we do here? Yeah, we start with the festivals. I uh, sorry, we changed format, and I'm just like, what are we doing? All right, Welcome so to our show. we're still figuring it out. A year in. Um. Okay, so uh, this week I did the research for a special, and I'm maybe gonna butcher this name, and I apologize. It's the Awuru Odo Festival. It is observed mm. biennially, which is once every two years, starting sometime between September and November and departing in April. So it only happens every other year, but it happens for like six months. So That's so many months. So many months. And in April is when the main festival is held. So it like starts in October-ish, but it ends... The big festival isn't until April. It is a Nigerian religi religious festival of the Igbo religion. Among the Igbo people, the Odo are spirits of the dead, and much like several other festivals globally uh, during this time, the Odo return to Earth to visit their families. Mm. And... Uh, when they depart in April, there is a big theatrical c performance called the Odo Play, reenacting the story of their visit and kind of like the pain of their departure from everyone yet again as they go back to the afterlife. So each individual family holds a welcoming ceremony for its particular Odo group, but the big celebration in April features all the Odo groups from all the families. The performance takes place in the Nwankwo Market Square of Yuki, uh, <laughs> which is a city in Nigeria, uh, where there is an Odo shrine and a ritual stage permanently located. Uh, the characters in the play are concealed by large masks and grass outfits, so you can't identify them. Uh, mm -hmm. People who go to the play dress in their best clothing and they serve as the actual chorus for the play so the audience is also the chorus oh that sounds great and immediately after the performance ends the Odo climb the surrounding Yukihi hills and make their way back to the land of the dead taking with them the prayers of the living who over the last six months have appealed to them for things such as abundant crops many children whatever you know they're looking for at that time and that is the Odo Festival. Wow, that is uh, I think in our research because we looked all yeah we looked up a whole bunch of festivals before we started doing this segment. I co I could not believe that it is a six month festival, but it doesn't sound like it's constantly going for six months. It sounds like there's some big events tied to it. Yes, so like there's like a little shrine that they build a fence around in like their area, like locally and stuff, and that's where like the Odo hang out and do their stuff. And then like there's like some small stuff throughout the six months, but there is a the, the big festival in April, which uh, was last month, is where like the big event happens. It's kind of amazing to me. We've been doing this new segment for a few for a few episodes now. I think we've been doing this. This is probably our fourth. Um, I've done segment. two now, and I think you've done okay. two. This is our fourth. Um, it seems like that the common theme is always the spirits of your dead family coming back and visiting, and you sending them off with better than what they had. When they came from the underworld or wherever they're coming from, yes, it's kind of amazing to see how like these these touchstones, these these parts of the ceremony seem to span every culture. And I think we'll just keep seeing that 
And much like some of the others, I left it out because I didn't want to get it wrong because I looked at a few sources and I couldn't quite nail down exactly it. But there is a food component to this, um, kind of mm-hmm. like the Hungry Ghost Festival and others where like you have to like you create food for the Odo and people coming to visit the Odo, etc. Like you have to keep everyone well fed. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's a lot like the Hungry Ghost Festival. Yeah. So um, like it's not specifically because they're hungry but they are it's like family is visiting so you have to create these meals and such that's amazing but i uh again i don't want to go too deep into that because uh i read a few articles and i couldn't quite nail it down so i you know just wanted to throw it there that there's also that similarity without going into too many details for fear of getting them wrong yeah that's one of the hardest parts of this is just like trying to do our best you know we're not cultural anthropologists we're just two guys with a <laughs> two guys with a podcast and you don't want to get it wrong uh so i implore anybody who knows anybody who's listening out there who knows more about these festivals i'd love to learn more because i'm having a lot of a lot of fun learning about these festivals to yes. report them back to you all yeah, they are cool, and you're right. It's really cool to see that, like, in China, and then Nigeria, and then North America, and, like, across continents, the same ceremony kind of popping up, where, like, these people have had little to no interaction with each other. These religions yeah. have had little to no interaction with each other, but these common themes are really cool. Yeah, it just, I think it's, you know, really just the painting the, the tapestry of how, painting the tapestry, that doesn't make sense. I mean, you could be vandalizing it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, did you hear about Did you see on the news? The Mona Lisa, yeah. The Mona Lisa, but that's protected under glass, so that guy didn't do Yeah, but they hit it with a piece of cake. And he was disguised as an old woman. And it was to protest climate change? I don't know, man. I don't, I don't follow the thread. I'm super... I mean, yeah, climate change, bad. Agreed. Um... How did, I don't know what this was to accomplish, but good, good for that guy. He he got something done, I suppose. He uh he made the news. <laughs> he made the news. He made international Mona, news. We're talking Mona about Lisa it on the remains okay. <laughs> talking about it on the big podcasts. Um, on unrelated related news, I might die during this podcast due to a haunting. A uh, a ball just rolled by me. I'm alone in this room. You have cats, though. No, they... are you ever are you ever alone if you have cats? I do have cats, but there are no cats with me right now. That you can see. That what if I it's can a ghost see. Of a cat. Um, I mean, I do see like a ghost cat out of the corner of my eye a lot. I'm cre- I'm regularly like, oh, one of the cats is here. One of the cats is not here. What did I just see? There's a there's a topic for a future episode: stories of ghost pets. Oh yeah, absolutely. We my cats on the, on the list. My my cats love to do that thing, and I may have mentioned this on the podcast before, where they both kind of like stare at something that isn't there, but they'll both do it at the same time, looking at the same spot. But they won't be together. They'll be in like two different rooms, <laughs> looking at the same conjoining point at an empty space, and I'm like, that's unnerving. I think the the lesson there is that cats can see four dimensionally. Yes, absolutely. They're not living in our reality. They are they are fourth dimensional beings. Now, I guess my son is age appropriate for a invisible friend. And during COVID, when he's not been socialized, the, I feel like the chances of him having an invisible friend are greatly heightened. Mm-hmm. But my son has started talking to nothing. Oh, that's bad news. He will just turn and be like, okay, bye. And then like, vi- like visually follow nothing out of the room. Like his head will turn until it's gone and then he'll turn back to the dinner table. But he's always looking up like it's like an adult. And mm. at night over the baby monitor, a lot of the time we'll hear him go, no, don't. And it's just like, this is terrifying. My son sees ghosts. Ghosts are bothering my son. Here's one of the things you can do. Because you know, when was your house built? Your house was built in the 1989 by the previous owner. So unless he murdered someone here or it was built on a burial ground. Which is possible because it's New England and pretty much every... I'm 
on everywhere is an old burial ground. I'm on an old colonial like farm is where my house yeah. is. Yeah, somebody's definitely buried on the property. I'm not saying that as being like, ooh, spooky. It's just like realistically, if it was an old colonial farm, there's a body somewhere over there because that's just, you know, not everybody got buried in the local cemetery. A lot of people got buried on the farm. I mean, I think we had this discussion in our pilot episode that never aired. and We uh, definitely did. You sent me that website to find old colonial cemeteries, and it found out there was one not on my property, but literally just past the edge of my property is an mm -hmm. old colonial cemetery. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't refute it, but it is really disconcerting to, like, hear across the baby bottle, like, no, no, don't. And we have, like, a camera on it, and we'll look in, and he will visibly be talking to someone and, like, handing them away, like, pushing with his hand, and it's just like, <sighs> I hate that. I just, I absolutely <laughs> hate it. I don't know how to put it into more words. And then again, you'll be talking and he'll look over and be like, oh, hi, to like no one and like acknowledge them for a minute. And they're like, okay, bye. And like wave and then watch them leave the room. And you're like, he's not playing games with an imaginary friend or anything. There's just a ghost in my house that he can see. Now, whatever you hear about something like this, all I can think to myself is just who you gonna call? I wish. I wish there was someone right? to call. Yeah, but we don't know who. There's no way to to finish that question. We need to do an episode on the new Ghostbusters, I think. I finally I just, haven't watched it yet. I have I not haven't watched it. Either it just came to HBO Max. Oh, it did? Yes. Oh, I have HBO. It came like last week, so but we can get back on the topic of uh you know what helps you live with ghosts in your house sam a drink tell me oh what are you drinking this week steve so this is on topic for two things both what i just spoke of and what we will be discussing tonight <laughs> my drink is called liquid courage oh good one yeah now, you definitely need that when you got ghosts liquid courage is my favorite type of uh alcoholic beverage and it's one that you make in a blender hmm. um and it's a milkshake which is just the best way to get alcohol in your body if you're me um mm. so it's one pint of milk six ounces of vodka four to six scoops of whatever ice cream you want uh i'd say as a default do like a vanilla or a chocolate but you know play around flavors and then eight to twelve ounces of creme de coco or chocolate liqueur and uh six ounces of bacardi white rum then you throw it in the blender until it's a shake. How many people does this serve? I mean, this would probably just be something for me and my wife on an evening. Okay, so two people at the very least, because like, that's this is it. Just sounds like it sounds like a lot of dairy to start. It is a, like a lot, lot of, dairy. of dairy. Yes. Um. So I've got notes on this because I've actually been making something similar to this for years, and I've played around with it. And first of all, you don't need the vodka and the rum. Oh, that sounds very excessive. You can choose one. I find the rum works better, but there are some flavored vodkas that, like whipped cream vodka and stuff, could go very nicely in this. I would lean towards the rum. Um, the creme de coco is good. Godiva actually makes a great chocolate liqueur that I love to put in this um, that I would recommend over creme de coco or cacao or whatever you know yeah um so those are my two uh things and also take a tiny bit of hershey syrup and drizzle it around the inside of the glass before you pour the shake in oh sure of and course yeah that's those are my recommendations on this this is not a bad template but i think the vodka and the rum is excessive together and go from there but you know if that's your thing i've never really thought vodka and rum blended very well it seems redundant they both have the same end goal yeah that doesn't seem necessary I, i'm not a i'm no mixologist but i don't know what we're doing there yeah so you know that's my drink it is a drink? really good summertime 
drink, actually. Um, it's a little uh, heavy, that... but it's nice and cold and boozy. So uh, I was kind of introduced to this actually in South Carolina at like a poolside resort we were staying at for my cousin's wedding, and they were churning out basically this, and it was just amazing in the heat. Mm. So, um, yeah. What are you drinking? Okay. I drank, and this is not thematically appropriate, but I, I had these ingredients in my house, and it <laughs> sounded good. A praying mantis cocktail uh, found on cocktailbuilder.com, which you introduced me to, which is uh, one and a half ounces of white tequila, five ounces of cola, one teaspoon of lemon juice, and two teaspoons of lime juice. Um, I've had that everything. before. Yeah, you shake it. In... You shake cola. Well, no, you put the cola in after you've shaken the okay. other ingredients. Okay. Shake everything except the cola uh, with ice, strain into a highball glass, and then add the cola. Oh, I mean, you wouldn't want to shake the cola. Remember lime coke? Yeah, I never. I you know I tried a couple of the different like citrus. No, no, not the not the new up. ones, not the ones where it's like the, the like the fountain drink machines in a can. I'm talking back when we were like in college, like nineteen years ago. Oh, don't! Oh, I hate how true that is. Um, they had like yeah, vanilla but, coke, yeah, was... and they had lime coke for like two years. Yeah. Um, lime coke was actually really good as a base for this. I used to do this, but just I'd crack open a lime coke and it would uh, mix very well with the tequila like this, and then you just drop a lemon in. Yeah, this was pretty good. It was a little bit too sour for me. I think I'd cut back a lemon in the lime juice next time, you know, because then it would just be um, coke and tequila, which is you know, something I used to drink. A lot of, uh, more of it's a college kid standard. <laughs> yeah, I drink that a lot. I drink a lot of Coke and tequila in college. Um, so I'd probably just do it with like half the amount of citrus juice. It was just a little bit too sour for my taste. I feel like a lot of the drinks I end up picking are have citrus in them. I you... don't know why that is. I think it's because you're Mexican, Sam. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> I think it's a palate thing. It could be. I'm I just mean... saying, I look at what you cook a lot. And you, 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 citrus. you love citrus. And it's good. I love citrus. But you definitely, I think, are drawn towards the citrus palette. Yeah, I can't even get away from it. Because it's 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 onion, citrus, cilantro. Yeah. Are pretty much the main components of most of what I cook. Well, that's because your dad can do so yeah. much with those three ingredients. And he taught you <sighs> to cook. He did. I'm huge on citrus in summer drinks, especially. Like, if it's a summer drink, I'm either doing something citrus or something with, like, chocolate and milk for some reason. Um, it's just a good... It's kind of like ice cream. It's an adult ice cream in the hot summer. But otherwise, it's, like, grapefruit juice and, you know, pineapple juice and just all these different... If, if it mango, citrus, just do that in the summer it's just so refreshing what are we talking about this week <laughs> so this week we are talking about courage the cowardly dog which i thought you were throwing me like a you know a good ali oop for to get into earlier with what you need courage to do and um well that was a long time ago so we yeah that was a good seven minutes ago that will get cut <laughs> we were uh we watched Courage the Cowardly Dog, which initially aired as a uh, animated short on the What a Cartoon show on Cartoon Network, mm -hmm. and it's one of the many shows from that first season that did so well that it got its own show. Other notable shows from What a Cartoon show that got spinoffs were Johnny Bravo, Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Lab, um... Johnny Bravo, did I say that already? Um, you did. Cow and That's Chicken. That's a good show. Yeah, like, it um, had a lot of good spinoffs during that time, but Courage the Cowardly Dog came out of that, and it was definitely not my favorite as a kid of those shows, um, 
but it's definitely something I watched enough to have memories, like distinct memories of. Mm-hmm. So it aired initially on What a Cartoon Show in 1996. Uh, it was actually uh, nominated for an Academy Award for that short, which is what got it greenlit for its own series, which premiered three years later in 1999 and then ran until 2002. I did not realize that it was a three-year gap before some of these shows came out. I imagine there, there's got to be a lot of lead time for hand-drawn animation, because that was you know, pre uh, computer animated era. That was literally, you know, somebody sat down and drew each animation cell back in the late nineties. Um so I'm not surprised it took that long to get it out. Yeah, that makes sense. Just as a kid it didn't seem like that long of a time when really like as a kid that was a huge amount of time. That was sixth grade to like ninth grade. Sure. That's you know your, uh, your target audience will have grown out of <laughs> yeah. the show before it airs. Exactly. So, wow, that's uh impressive. But <laughs> so yeah, Courage Cowardly Dog. We watched. We both watched the pilot as per our normal thing, and then we each watched a different episode. Um, I was originally going to watch uh. The Return of the Chicken from Outer Space as my second episode, but I didn't realize that the pilot wasn't included in the series, so the pilot is technically not episode one, and without having uh, us both watch the pilot, it was weird to watch a sequel to it, so I skipped it and I watched something else. Okay, dokie. So, also, I did go back and rewatch the pilot after watching this, and the pilot is mm. definitely different enough from the show. There are distinct differences. Um, you can tell it's like a weird proof of concept. Oh, I didn't watch the pilot. What was it? Um, what were the differences between um, uh, the pilot and the final product? Well, besides just some animation uh, differences, um, like uh, Muriel is much smaller and skinnier. In okay. The, um, there's real life things mixed in with it, like the pictures on the wall have real photos in them and stuff. And uh, Courage is just much more of a scaredy cat in this one. He's like scared of mice and stuff, and so they don't take him seriously in the pilot because he's already scared of everything, as opposed to in the show where he's genuinely scared because weird, freaky stuff is happening. You know what I you mean? Know, something, yeah, yeah. Something that I would say I noticed immediately. Because I also did not really watch um, Courage that much. It wasn't one of the Cartoon Network shows I really went for. I think I mostly watched Johnny Bravo and um, Powerpuff Girls were the ones I was really into. I was huge into Johnny Bravo and Dexter's Laboratory. Dexter's Lab, definitely. But Courage was not one I went in for a lot. And watching it now, I realized that he is... I would not describe him as cowardly. Yeah. Uh he is not a coward. Is always he's always scared, uh, and he's nervous. But he, he has every right never, to be. He absolutely does because he's going up against some weird, freaky stuff. But he does not shy away from diving in to do what he needs to do. He, I would absolutely say that he is courageous and not cowardly. I agree. He's a good character. I love that. It doesn't matter how scared he gets. He's always from the the episodes that I watched. He always, you know, he's like, okay, here we go. And he, you know, he's he's terrified the whole time, but he goes in for it. Also, and I don't a hundred percent remember on this one, uh, but I'm pretty sure in the pilot he doesn't talk. He just does that whimper thing that he does when he's like flustered. Oh, okay. Because... I couldn't remember before watching this. I couldn't remember if he talked or if he just made noises. Yeah. I, I... thought he was just, he just made noises and never actually spoke. But I don't wrong. recall him ever speaking in the pilot. And one of my notes initially while watching the show was I don't remember him talking. I forgot Courage could talk. And I think it's because in the original pilot, he didn't talk. 
but that's just like a weird little note. So there's just some differences in the original, some animation differences, um, and just the fact that he is like scared of just random mice in the house and stuff. So like the reason that no one ever takes him seriously is because he's actually cowardly, but that doesn't make it across in the full series. Mm. So we watched uh, the first episode, uh, which I just lost the title of because I'm great. Night at Cat's Motel. That's not the first episode. Uh, this is according to Wikipedia. No, oh, it wasn't according to HBO. Um, oh, okay. On HBO, the Shadow of Courage is the first episode. I watched that. I watched a Cat's Motel, and I watched The Shadow of Courage. Oh, so. great. So okay. we're still you, good. We're still good. I almost watched Cat's Motel, so glad I didn't. But yeah, Shadow of Courage was on HBO the first one, and honestly, I didn't think to question that for whatever reason. So, Shadow of Courage has a pretty dark opening. Hmm. That's my first note in the whole thing. I was like, oh wow, the opening to this show is a little dark. It is a uh, um crotchety old rich man um, who's a jerk to everyone and his employees fires his butler of 50 years and as the butler's leaving he hears the man have a heart attack but he's just been fired so he doesn't call come when he's summoned and he leaves the man to die <laughs> yeah I was uh, yeah I was like okay off to a, off to a much darker start than I re- remembered this show being Absolutely. And uh, then the the deceased man's shadow breaks free and ends up in the middle of nowhere where Courage lives and begins to torment him and his family. So, a uh, weird, dark opening for a kid's show. Not, like, unrealistic or anything, but dark for a 90s kid's show. Or maybe not, from what I'm learning. The 90s were apparently very dark. I think I understand why millennials have such dark humor. Yeah, I think in the 90s, I think there was a lot of, we were moving out of the kind of bright, always positive cartoons of the 80s. I think it was the people who grew up with the cartoons of probably the 1970s, which were, again, were Hanna bright and poppy. Yeah, yeah, the Hanna-Barbera cartoons of the early era were making cartoons in the 90s. I think that's when we started seeing the subversive cartoons. Because I think that's... And that's... The 90s is when cartoons got weird. Yes. Got real weird. Really weird. At least in the mainstream. Of course, there was always, like, you know, earlier on, you could always say, you know, like, Fritz the Cat and... Like, anything made by, um... Guy who did Fritz the Cat right now, his name completely escapes me. Um, well, I'm gonna look that up before I go. I don't even know if I know Fritz the Cat. Was that a Bakshi? That was 1972, so that wasn't 80s. All right, that's what I'm saying. It was early. Um, that was like the first very, very strange cartoon like kind of like gross subversive adult oriented cartoon one of the first ralph bakshi was the director was based on comic strip by r crumb um then into the 90s children's cartoons being made by people who grew up with the earlier you know the 60s 70s 80s bright happy cartoons of those eras they think they started putting out this sort of weirder stuff, and that's what you're seeing with Courage the Cowardly Dog. One of the first like weird cartoons that was aimed at kids. I have to also go back and watch Eek the Cat. Probably oh. worth uh, checking out again. Yeah, we could definitely... We should have done a Courage the Cowardly Dog versus Eek the Cat. That's a very good juxtaposition of two shows. Or comparison. But, all right. So, uh, these this animation style, it's weird. It is weird. It's kind of Rocco's Modern Life meets like Ren and Stimpy. Yeah, I would say it's in that same vein. Looks like uh, it reminds me a lot of Dilbert. Dilbert was very popular at that time, and yes. that even got its own cartoon show. It's sort of 
I, I don't know how to describe this style other than to say that it was very popular in this era. Of it's the a late very, 90s. very 90s cartoon network. Yeah. Very angular sort of characters for the villains. I, feel, I think all the villains were very angular. Um, all the good characters were kind of very round and sort of soft. And, and I might not have enough of a cross sample to, to say, but at least in some of these episodes, that's how I felt they were coming off. Um. Yeah, it's it. It definitely starts. It it comes in letting you know that this is not a bright and sunny cartoon. This show is going to be um, darker and more subversive. With that guy just immediately dying. And so, uh, in this episode, courage uh, keeps getting scared by a shadow that can take any form. So he gets locked out of the bedroom and he gets thrown into the attic where he's perpetually just being tormented by this thing until it kind of starts focusing on other members of the house where we get to one of the tropes of the show, which is courage having to get back to the attic where they have the old, old dial up modem computer. I that love that part. I love it. I forgot about the snarky computer that this kind of is like Google if Google was a person and just has this search engine that just judges him and then just like feeds him bad answers. <laughs> um, it was a very, very nineties understanding of the internet. Just yes. typing your question in and getting a response because that would have been the ask Jeeves era. I felt like it was an evil version of ask Jeeves. Absolutely. I think that's a really good summary of like that, even with the accent and stuff. It's like, Oh dear. An evil shadow. So Ask Jeeves probably would have been at its height at that time, because it was created in '96. I'm just looking it up now. Oh, and it lasted until 2006, so it was around for 10 years. I feel like this was definitely the Ask Jeeves. This this that computer was Ask Jeeves as an evil character, or at least not maybe not evil, but as a jerky character. So I liked this episode. It was fun. It was creative. It was a good introductory episode to the show. It was in no way like a perfect episode, but it definitely gives you the universe. It gives you the concept. It gives you the characters. And, you know, it does some fun 90s era type of tropes. Yeah. Um. I, what I liked about it was it wasn't like it was even the... It wasn't the old man's ghost. It was the old man's shadow. Yes. The shadow wasn't the old man. The shadow just escaped from the old man. Think about that. It shadow, other than having been that old man, shadow had wasn't him. It wasn't the old man. It had its own thoughts and it had its own hopes and dreams that play out through the resolution of the episode. That's such a weird thing. It's such like a weird it, Peter Pan tie-in where your shadow has its entire own personality. Right, and it all and that, that meant that watching that guy die at the beginning was just to watch him die, and you know for the shadow to escape. But the shadow, we didn't even need that opening sequence. It could have been the shadow could have just showed up out of nowhere and been a weird entity. We get to see, you know, we get to get the first couple of minutes of this series with um, elderly land, elderly man dying, his butler walking off because he just got fired, and we never go back to those characters. Yes. Yeah, it was strange. Never Jockingly. revisited. <laughs> revisited. So and that was all. It's a fifteen-minute, fifteen-minute sort of thing. So we have another fifteen-minute episode after that. Yeah, so the second half of the episode uh, is the amnesia episode where Muriel gets hit on the head and cannot remember any of them, which is a problem for Courage because the farmer who uh, owns the house and is with Courage's owner's husband um, hates Courage. So the second she doesn't remember Courage, he gets thrown out of the house. <laughs> Uh, which you would think would just be the biggest problem of the episode, but no. Uh, 
Courage manages to get to the computer and call for a doctor, but the doctor is actually a scam artist who's looking to rob the house. He is a French doc, a French duck, Doctor Lequack, who is actually a recurring villain in the show. Mm. But this is his first appearance. I do love the gag, where Courage always has to kind of find a way back into the attic. Mm. I don't know if that was in any of your episodes. It was in all of mine. No, the episode the other episode that I watched took place outside of the house. Oh, okay. Yeah, there there was a recurring gag throughout the show where he basically needs to get into the attic somehow. So like he fires a catapult at the window and misses the window and goes through the wall or he digs up like a giant pit in the ground and like pulls out a ladder that he buried instead of a bone and climbs up to the window like he's always got something that can get him up to the attic if he gets locked out of the house which is a fun Basically. little running gag makes sense for a supposedly cowardly dog because the attic is always the scariest part of the house the attic or a basement the basement I think in their house get. is the terrifying one the attic he seems to spend a lot of time in okay safe space then so amnesia episode um i like nearly it. as dark not yeah, nearly as dark it's a fun weirdly unnecessarily french duck <laughs> that is just trying to rob the house while courage does 19 cartoons antics to try and get him out of the house until the police show up and since they live in the middle of nowhere, it always takes forever for whoever's going to show up to show up. So, this is the episode we both watched. Main questions. Good for kids? Today's kids? What do you think? I didn't see anything bad for today's kids. Hmm. Like, I don't know if my kid's going to be interested in it. I know growing up, I wasn't super into it, but again, I had just hit high school when it came out. Yeah, so we were too late for it. We were too late for it, but I never saw anything like specifically bad except for the fact that, much like The Simpsons, uh, the farmer is regularly strangling Courage. Mm. Um, kind of just like the Homer Simpson Bart strangle. That was the only like truly, you know... Uncomfortable uncomfortable thing doesn't age well yeah. <laughs> that doesn't age well but like the internet still kind of weirdly holds up in a kid's show at least mm. dead so I don't know I'd say you know if my son tries to watch this I won't be devastated <laughs> yeah I feel the same way it's like it's it's tamer than a lot of the stuff my four year old watches yeah and... I would have a problem with her watching but I don't know that she would go in for it and I don't know if, like, I'm going to push this on my kid, but if he, like, finds it and watches it, I'm not going to be like, oh, not this one. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to want him to yeah. watch it all the time, but if it's if he has an episode or two on in the background while I work, I can handle that. And what was the other episode you watched? Okay, so the second episode that I watched, The Demon in the Mattress slash Freaky Fred. It was originally the fourth episode of season one. So The Demon in the Mattress is a take on The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. It's a 90 kids show's take on The Exorcist. Basically, uh, Muriel, the uh, female owner, needs a new mattress and she orders one from a special ad in the paper from what is clearly a demonic company on the phone <laughs> and uh, Courage immediately realizes this it's dropped off by like a demented weasel and a demonic vole of some sort <laughs> and uh, Muriel immediately gets possessed when she sleeps in it and Courage needs to find a way to get the demon out of the body and a new mattress so uh and this one's different because eustace the farmer and courage actually team up in this one they both recognize there is a problem 
and they both work together to try and exercise her and get her away from the bed. Which, um, I think it was nice only four episodes in that they show that the farmer isn't always the worst. He's just a jerk. Um, <laughs> this also had that weird 90s thing that we talked about in our Ghostbust- Extreme Ghostbusters episode where there's just inclusion unnecessarily of bad CGI. Like, oh, yeah. It just, like, didn't need to be there. Like, the, the, the vehicle that they drop the mattress off from is, like, a demonic horse and buggy. But it's partially CGI. Not even the whole thing. And I'm just like, why is... What, what was this artistic choice? I wonder if it is... That was the early era of CGI because like what was reboot was probably like 94 this isn't too many years into CGI being regular kids cartoons I think I think the way courage going back to what you were saying about the pilot how they had like regular photographs in all of the picture frames in the pilot episode wonder if it was to make it seem more wrong like here is something that is completely out of place with the rest of this animation because it's a completely different form of animation well that's how you know it's bad i guess because in the pilot actually the original one it's the chicken from outer space the chicken from outer space shows up in a cgi spaceship which mm. kind of cements your theory where like this is clearly something wrong and out of place and being cgi in a two-dimensional hand-drawn cartoon world does seem wrong and out of place so i'll, I'll accept that answer all right then so um this one wasn't bad it was a solid episode so i remembered the second half of this episode uh freaky fred which is why i watched this one but then after watching it i did look up like some of the top rated episodes just to kind of research them and this was actually one of the top rated episodes it is the top rated episode on imdb just when it comes to like creep factor so it um it wasn't like particularly creepy or scary it's not like some shows where they have that one just like out there episode that scars children mm. this was just a solid like spooky kid show episode um and then the second half of it is called fred and fred has some serious weird Coraline vibes to it mm. he has a big toothy smile that's way too big for his face he only speaks in rhymes and he seems like dresses like really upstanding but he's just clinically insane and it's uh muriel's nephew who is coming to visit but it turns out he is he is her nephew but he's an escaped mental patient oh no and uh he's in a home for clinically insane barbers and he uh, gets locked in a bathroom with courage and keeps trying to shave him. Ooh. And um, that's a really good episode because the whole thing is narr It's not from Courage's perspective. It's narrated by Fred. So you kind of take this journey with Fred and it's about him and his visit all done in weird, creepy rhymes. And almost every like set of rhymes ends in the word naughty. Because he's going to do something naughty. And oh. then he had a thought that was very naughty. And, like, it just continues to build and build and build as Courage loses more and more fur. Just trying to get out of this bathroom. And this was a really good one. Um, it's It's unnerving and unsettling. And you know this guy is wrong, but, like, there's nothing immediately wrong about him you know what i mean kind of like Coraline. Mm -hmm. um again i had like just big Coraline vibes off of this <clears throat> so yeah i just did a little bit of googling it looks like there's a ton of fan art for this character yes that's one of the reasons i grabbed it because he was the thumbnail and i was like i remember this guy distinctly like i he is really creepy it looks like the Beetlejuice cartoon, like what you imagined Beetlejuice might have looked like before he died. Yes, that's a really good description. description. A living Beetlejuice, I think, is the best description you can give. <laughs> I nailed it. Now that you've said it, it's all that I can see. <laughs> 
But yeah, Freaky He's Fred. Very freaky. Was a was very, a very good episode. Um, just you know, it's very '90s, but it's also very classic horror. Crap. Like that old, like you know, escaped mental patient. Something seems off about this guy. Is there something off about this guy? Yes, there's absolutely. Yeah, you know what I mean. That old, like almost like a 1950s Vincent Price type of a thing. So, that's what I watched. What did you watch? I watched what is listed on HBO, which is where I was watching this, as the first episode, um, which is the um, the first half is A Night at the Cat's Motel. So that one is Courage, and the owners, Eustace and Muriel, are on a vacation. They stop in at a little motel, the motel is run by an evil cat named Katz, K-A-T-Z, spelled like Dr. Katz, who, once they start spending the night in the hotel, he tries to feed them to the giant spiders who also live in the hotel. So he is kind of the keeper of these giant evil spiders. And he's trying to feed the Courage and his family to the spiders. So this was... This was creepy. This is spooky. Weird. Giant monster spiders are always um, unnerving. Uh, they did this really cool thing with the animation where instead of being outlined in black, there's an extended sequence where Muriel is fighting with one of the spiders and is outlined in bright green. Again, I think it's that same idea to kind of make it seem out of place with the rest of the animation. Um, it was It was pretty scary. You know, again, I would say for a kid it would be pretty... Um, uh, a spooky, creepy episode. You know, kids are always afraid of spiders. Adults are afraid of spiders. Uh, so I would say that it really nails that weird, unnerving 1990s creepy vibe with A Night at the Cat's Motel. The second half of that episode is Cajun Granny Stew, which follows... Uh, Muriel is a, has fallen asleep and is attempted to be kidnapped by a Cajun fox who is trying to cook her into granny stew to win a contest. So it is Courage attempting to save Muriel from being cooked into a stew. And that plays much more like um, a non-creepy, non-spooky cartoon. Uh, it feels much more in line with any of a number of cartoons that would have been popular at that time where it's it felt more like... Um, kind of weird Buttons and Mindy episode where, um, where Courage is trying to keep Muriel from getting herself into trouble while she's sleepwalking and doing various things as, while she's asleep. All right. It's okay. That's a pretty standard Courage concept. Yeah, it felt pretty... Uh... Yeah. Uh, it felt right on the nose what the cartoon was being. I thought it was I thought it was good. I would say that the I, the Cats Motel is the stronger part of that episode. Uh, it definitely got the whole It's a better encapsulation of what Urge is overall because again he's fighting these giant monster spiders. Uh and the other one felt a bit more generic. This was the first episode to air, which is why I think it is yeah, this is the first episode to air. Because I think why the episode order... The episodes seem to be out of order online. I feel like every good spooky show has a... Like, we stopped at a haunted and or seedy motel episode. Mm-hmm. Like, any spooky show worth its salt has that episode. Um, I mean, it was a huge Scooby-Doo trope. Um, but even, like, Mysteries Incorporated had one of those episodes. Um, one of my favorite Looney Tunes things ever, actually, was um, Looney Tunes did a spooky movie. It was, like, a Daffy Duck movie where he inherits, like, a million dollars and starts like a ghost busting business. Okay. Um it's called Daffy Duck Quackbusters. Okay, and I've heard of that one. 
yeah, it was one of my favorite ones growing up, and I believe Elmer Fudd owns, uh, I can't remember the Looney Tunes cat's name, Sylvester? Sylvester, yeah. He owns Sylvester, and he stopped at what is clearly an incredibly haunted motel, and things are trying to murder him all night as he sleeps, and it's just Sylvester nervously, in a very Courage the Cowardly Dog way, just trying to keep him alive through the night, and Elmer is completely oblivious to everything. <laughs> um, Quackbusters is, I mean, I i kind of want to watch it for the show, just because I want to watch it myself to see if it's any good still, but it was one of my favorites growing up. Um, yeah, I think that'd be worth checking out. There's also a <laughs> Courage the Cowardly Dog Scooby Doo crossover. Yes, um, that came out September of last year. Yes, so that I did might not be a good one to do on Halloween. I did not get to see that, but I think we should absolutely add that to the list. Hmm. Oh yeah, I'll totally. I'll check that one out. Cool. But yeah, I I've always liked the motel episodes because it, it's always a good way to get characters out of their normal element and like a, it's also a place that like you're not going to find yourself in like a weird haunted house but you will find yourself in an unfamiliar motel at some point in your life <laughs> yeah it's is definitely something that comes up a lot in just spooky media because you're in a place that should be feel comfortable, but it's also unfamiliar. I think that's why the spooky hotel uh, remains such a trope. I mean, it's you know after after Psycho, I think we can we can pretty um, definitively say that hotels are scary, motels especially. They're so transient. There's nothing permanent about them, so it makes it feel like a place where if you didn't come back from, no one would ever know that you were there. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole concept of Psycho, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, exactly. So people go to the Bates Motel and they don't come back. Uh, it just so happens to be, you know, in the, the, the plot of that, that movie, people actually take notice of the fact that somebody went missing. Yeah, that's the outlier for that. Yeah. Cool. So I yeah. Would, yeah, I would say that... Um... Birds of Cowardly Dog, it holds up pretty well. I wouldn't call it perfect for for a kid today. I don't know that a kid today would have the end up paying too much attention to it, but I would be interested offensive. to hear a kid's opinion on this one. I don't normally say that. I would actually be interested in like showing this to a kid and be like, "Does this hold up? Is this good?" Because, you know, right. we, we talk about how all media is present a lot. And so, like, they're, like what we consider old is technically just the same as anything else if it's accessible to a kid these days. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not, like, clearly old. It's not, like, Hanna-Barbera 70s quality. Like, the 90s stuff, to a degree, looks enough like stuff that they're used to seeing that I think it could slip in, and I'd be interested to see what they thought. All right, I'll see if I can get my kid to sit down and watch it. All right. What she says, I'll report back. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's all we've got out of courage. I have it. Um, I have the whole series now, because that's what I do. Um, I'm a collector of old spooky things. So maybe I'll revisit it when my kid gets a little older. But uh, my kid's easily scared, so I feel like he'll, you know, either hate it or he'll think it's the best thing ever because one of his favorite things while watching cartoons is running when they run because, like, everything in our house is a circle. So he can just, like, run around the couch or whatever in a circle and, like, run <laughs> when the characters run. That's a big thing he likes to do. Um, like in our office the couch is in the middle of the room and he will grab my hand when it's time to run and I'll get up from my desk and we'll run around the couch once or twice and then when the running is done he'll sit on the couch and I'll sit back at my desk and continue typing oh that's um, cute it is it's very cute it's occasionally a pain in the ass but uh, for the <laughs> most part it's pretty cute I'm lucky enough to have a job where typically that's not a huge disruption in my day 
Um, nice. So yeah, you know, he might love it. So maybe I'll break it out one day. But my wife had never seen it before, and she was actually not a fan. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, she, that's also a good litmus uh, where I'm like, do I just kind of remember these this era fondly and am kind of like chuckling at this thing that I haven't seen in, I'm not going to say how many years, or is this like remotely good? And she's like, I hated this. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> all right, so we know. No good for no good. your wife. Yeah, for my wife. So I'm probably not going to be putting it on during the day for a while just to spare her. But we'll Fair see. Enough. Okay. All right, where can they find us, Sam? Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We are at RT Spirits Pod. Please let us know if you have any ideas of things we can cover of uh, fun, family friendly, spooky stuff. Uh, or if you have any thoughts on Curtis the Dorug, we'd love to hear them. Thank you for joining us. As always, I'm Steve. And I'm Sam. And we'll talk to you next week in uh, Dad's Tiger S. You get to hear all that stuff that got cut out of this episode. And there, I think there was a oh, lot yeah. this time. There's a lot this time. All right. Get out of here. Get out of here. Finish your commute.